Welcome, everybody, as you come on in. I'm Marty Porter. Thanks for joining us. We'll start in a minute, and uh, just stay tuned. Be right with you as people come into the Zoom room. What's up, Marty? Hey, Tom, you're here. Yeah, I'm sick, too, but I'm okay. <laughs> I'm glad you're sick. And I'm, glad you're, I'm glad you're okay. I'm not glad you're sick. Sorry. You're glad I'm sick? Thanks, Marty. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, now let's start the show, guys, and welcome to welcome, welcome, welcome to the uh, fourth in our series of show follow up. Uh, the session today, 45 minutes of Q&A's, good chance for you to ask your questions of these experts. Alexandra Georgesco, uh, one of our leads from our show back in January, another lead for Alex Lindsay, who many of you know, Peter Thornton, who really was my compadre in getting the show going. Ryan Brody from CTI, Kyle Healy from the Global Leadership Network, and, uh, and Matt Morgan from Ross Video. I'm Marty Porter, and I'll be your host as we pass it on. Uh, just a couple of quick things, and uh, it will, the show was great. It was amazing. It's coming back uh, January 23rd. Keep that date in mind. We'll be back. Thanks again to Tom Baldessari from b &H for being a sponsor. And thanks again from ASG for also being an entitled sponsor of the event. They made it possible. Um, Amy, uh, let me just uh, give you a chance. Amy Lounsbury from ASG has a chance to explain what we're doing with the show, what we've been doing for the last few shows. So, Amy. Thanks, Marty. Yeah, so we actually are putting on a virtual job fair today. So once this panel wraps, you're going to hop over and check out the directions at the bottom. Hop on over to the break room and get to know both Savannah and Andrew Bridgewater. Savannah is one of our recruiters at ASG. Andrew Bridgewater is on our managed services team. Come on over, get to know us. Uh, we can share a little bit about um, ASG and our managed services team. And then let's get to know you a little bit and let's talk about some of the open positions that we have, what you're looking for. We have a lot of open positions on our website, but yeah, hop on over, find out what it's like to, to work with us and we'll get to know you a bit better. Hey, well, thanks, Amy. That's great. And here's the, here's the way it's going to work, guys. For the next 45 minutes, you're going to ask your questions in the chat. We put the speaker emails or in the chat for follow-ups if you, if you have any questions and want to pursue a private conversation, but uh, put your questions up there and let's try to make this as interactive as possible. Again, here are your experts, Alexandra, Alex, uh, Peter, Ryan, Kyle, and Matt. And with that, Alexandra, and I call, I'll call you Alexandra just to differentiate from Alex Lindsay. Alexandra Georgesco, why don't you kick it off? And any, ta any takeaways you had from the show that, that really were highlights for you this, this start up and stir up this conversation? Yeah, I mean, from our um, digital first production panel, uh, my takeaways were that there are a lot of flavors of digital events and hybrid events, and and you really need to evaluate what the needs of your event are. Um, and then there are a lot of tools out there, but I heard you know keeping um, keeping um, your attendees engaged. And offering Q&A um, is one of the best way to make good use of digital events. So here we are at the Q&A. That's great. Peter Thornton, anything on your end? Any quick takeaways from you? Uh, you know, first of all, it was like a whirlwind um, a couple of months ago. So what's cool about this is it just gives us the ability to kind of pick up where we left off, hopefully uh, address any questions that anybody that's on this session attended the last session, may have had some burning questions. Uh, so please feel free to put them in the chat. Um, my walk away was, um, I was excited, uh, but also also at the same time kind of nervous because what I kind of walked away with was we're wanting to do a Super Bowl level experience for all levels of tiers of shows and meetings and events. And so how do we accomplish all of that? So that's something I hope uh, we can talk about today. What are you guys all doing from tricks and tips and uh, anything else we have to share. So great. And Alex Lindsay, quick, quick summary from you. Yeah. I mean, I think that, I think one of the things that the takeaways after the, after our talk, after we did, after we had the, the thing, what people came up to me and talked a lot about was stretching the events out. So it was something I said almost as an aside at the end, but it seemed to bring a lot of people over to talk, which is the thought of, you know, if you have a, 
you know, we think about these events as, you know, one event that we're having per year. But what do you do, you know, as you start to think about what are these other events that you can do in between that are completely virtual, that we're not trying to figure out where we're going to do it. We're not trying to figure out, you know, how to handle a lot of those things, but putting putting events in between that are tying that together mm -hmm. and the concept of having conferences that like this one, like this, this session here that might happen for a month or two months where they culminate in a physical event, but there's a lot of events that are happening before and after them so that we don't have to have multiple tracks. We don't have to have, think people paying attention to a lot of things. We can have a singular conversation, but cover all of that over time as opposed to trying to do it all in the two or three days. And that seemed to hit a note that a lot of people responded to. All righty. Well, that was a good summary. Alex Georgesco, you want to kick it off with a question of your own? Yeah, I think um, it was also something Alex mentioned in our panel that um, some of the key metrics to make us feel good, like total viewers and concurrent viewers are not really what matters most. And then that we want to look at the harder things like average view time, attention time, sequential attendance of so who's attending these multiple events one after, or multiple sessions. So for the group opening it up to what are some of the strategies that are working for you to keep um, attendees engaged longer? And I'll you know raise your hand or wave if you have an answer. Alex. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I talked a lot about that. But, but you know, one of the things that we do, I do a daily show, of course, and I think a bunch of the people that are already part of that show are here today. Um, but uh, one of the things that that we do a lot is we have uh, chat and discussion and we're it's really just a QA. and a And that is something that we find has a huge impact on the average view time is just if you're actually taking those questions, we come right out of the gate asking questions, answering questions. And we and we now even if even in events where we have things we want to talk about, we try not to talk for more than a couple minutes at a time. And we get back to questions and we get back to the audience as often as we possibly can. And that seems to make a huge difference. And it makes a huge difference in physical events too. Uh, you know, when I, I'm speaking a bunch of times at NAB and, and my, my talks are the same way that the online ones are, which is that I will say a little bit and then answer some questions, talk a little bit, answer some questions. And so I think that that is a, I think that makes a huge difference in how people are engaged. And then it also, so our average view time goes up and we've seen this across thousands of events, the average view time spikes when you start to, when you start to have a lot of interactivity. Um, the other thing that, that makes a big difference is, um, the, it, it affects the sequential attendance as well. How long do they stay? Do they come to the next session? Do they come to the next day? Do they come to the next event? Uh, if they, if they feel like there's a reason to be there live, uh, otherwise they can just, they can just watch the VOD later, which, which really brings a lot of that energy out of the system. Same proposal you require that, um, Kyle, I know you guys do a, a lot of different types of events. Um, how do you um, get participants involved? Yeah, it's a great question. We have had events throughout the year. We have our big kind of key event in, in August where we have a kind of national audience of about 60, 70,000. But getting those people back in every few months to other events has been important for us. And actually, we have noticed the trend, maybe a, a bad trend from our organization is we've kind of ramped up what those events look like. And that's just, it's not sustainable. So how do we continue on with doing events, keeping them engaged? And uh, really, I took a lot away from Alex at our last session uh, in January. And so we're looking now at how do we rate, how do we bring these smaller events in? We don't need the big fancy production. We don't need the 4K broadcast. We don't need... The glitz and the glamour and the lights but how do we bring some of our speakers in and do that q a to engage people throughout the the whole year or uh, between our kind of flagship events <clears throat> and so i think that is key and that's going to be a a big thing for us as we move forward one of the things i find challenging for teams um putting on events is that interactivity how do we combine coming back to in-person events with maintaining that locomotive steam that we started two and a half years ago. So what's the, I'm going to ask anybody that wants to speak up here, be it in chat or on camera, how do we get back to what was and also what is today and a hybrid of that? Oh, and, and I'll argue that uh, what was wasn't very good 
<laughs> like, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, we, we look back on it. Like, yeah. you know, that's that whole, like, uh, let's go back to the past when it was great. It was never great. And most of us, I mean, I have to, I had to deal with return shots of, of audiences at all these big conferences. Cause like, we were streaming them and people were falling asleep. They were checking their email. They were doing everything else that was there. So the reality, we have to first understand that the physical events weren't that good when we were doing them before COVID. Um, we just, we just were in a mode that we went to them and then we'd kind of sit somewhere mm -hmm. in there and we'd slowly drift off because they're really boring. Um, and so how do we, you know, it, and the, the kind of techniques that I'm talking about have worked, uh, they have worked both in physical events as well as, as, uh, online events for the last decade. In fact, the Q and a system, we use our own Q and a system. Um, and that Q and a system ties both the physical audience and the online audience into one unified chat and Q and a, and that allows us to basically have them voting on questions and interacting with them. In fact, that Q and a system came out of physical events, not out of uh, online events because we wanted to get rid of the mic because <laughs> the mic is a horrible horrible thing a part of horrible part of physical events is having people walk up and pontificate for five minutes and then ask a question that no one cares about which is what 90 percent of them are you know and so so the it's it's um so i think that figuring out a way to to use those whether it's you know we have a q a system other people have q a systems there's lots of but figuring out a way to unify that so that the audience in the room and the audience in the uh, online event are, are in the same chat in the same process there makes a big difference one thing that was a challenge that's all fine and dandy when everything's live but when you do a lot of pre-recorded content that goes out in packages and then you try to intersperse that live aspect that's when things get a little bit tricky with that the, the, the most successful events that we've done in that in, environment have actually been to just deliver all the VOD before we do the live events. <laughs> like, you know, like it's not, there's not yeah. really, why are you making people watch everything at one X when you could just let them watch it at their, in their own, at their own time frame? Um, you know, and, and I think that we've seen a lot of people go back and forth. The advantage of doing VOD live with everyone else is that everyone can chat along and you can answer questions along it while they're watching it. So still that same Q and a system that we're talking about, or, or a, can, can allow you to tie that whole audience. And if you look at an Apple event, there's all these people doing all these things at the same time. And that's, there's a value to that. So having a unified conversation makes sense. But for the most part, the best experiences we've seen with these kinds of events is to deliver all the VOD one or two weeks ahead of time. And then, cause what that does is it greatly enriches the, the live. So then you just, the, the event becomes live discussion about the things that people watched. And if only 10 or 15% of the audience watches those videos, it will make a massive difference, an exponent, exponential difference in the number of questions and the number of, and, and the interactivity, because those people will drive that whole conversation from there. Alex, I'm going to pick on you for a second because at the early onset of all of this, you were helping produce a lot of these things. What were some of the tricks and tips that Microsoft was doing during this time to replicate the presenter coming back online for some of that VOD stuff? So segueing what Alex is talking about. Yeah, and I'll say that um, I, I don't quite agree that, you know, events were done poorly before because they just had different goals and people just knew like they were coming in person for five or six days and it was really long days, but they're also connecting. And we are seeing a lot of people that are asking for in person to come I, back. I, I just want to, I just want to say, I, I agree with you that there's a lot of reasons what I'm talking about. There's a lot of reasons to go to an event that, that are worth it. Uh, and that's the meetings and, and networking yeah. and, and walking through that. It's just the sessions, which is a lot of what we work on and what we talk about here we're never that good. Yeah, <laughs> I've, well, I've streamed a thousand. Yeah, and, <laughs> and you know, it's so sad to like go to some of these sessions and you have like five people sitting in the seats. And if you get the last time slot of the day, you're like, man, like I, I, day five. Hour. I would include the ones that have 15,000 <laughs> in seats. Like, you know, they just, they, no matter how much they did, you still had people falling asleep. Yeah. And then, but um, I think we're doing a lot of, a lot. so we, you know, went digital for two years and we took a lot of, we have a lot of data from that. So we are doing um, shorter keynotes. Some of them are pre-recorded. We still have engagement via chat with when we play those out. Um, a lot of content is getting um, given out on demand so people can just kind of watch at their own pace. But then that just that still means that there we have playouts and presenters that are available to actually interact with the participants, even though their session was pre-recorded. So um, those are some of the strategies we also have um kind of satellite events so like smaller 
smaller regional events where people can be in the same room and they're more sustainable because um, instead of like, you know, 50,000 attendees coming to Orlando for a week, you know, they're just going for three days to something uh, more local, like um, some people are coming to Seattle, some people are going to London, and they're kind of interacting with the people that are relevant to their uh, market as well. So there's a lot of um, a lot of different things that we are applying in there, like shorter content um, uh, and then more discussion based for when we are in person. Um, but I think what I want to know, and hopefully I answered your question, but what I want to know is. I know in um, Matt and Ryan's session, they talked about how some of the tools they're using have to work in parallel for both like the online and the in-person audience. So you're not managing two different processes. So like what what are what are the tools and tips for doing that? Because we're still kind of managing two different events now. You know, we're managing the, diff the digital event and we're managing the in-person event and they have different needs and goals and and it becomes a little hard right you want to take it away ryan sure yeah um yeah you're absolutely right i mean you have to really decide what type of event you're doing well in advance because um you know a lot of it can be video on demand and not necessarily a live talent um, and a lot of folks don't know the difference um, depending on how you do it so i think I think the tools of it all have to do with what the goal is if you're going to be hybrid, totally virtual, totally live, and, and how you're going to bring all that together, whether it be um, using a you know, Unity intercom system to kind of talk to other areas where you've brought folks in to have their own group of people that are going to stream into an event. Um, there's other, you know, uh, TVU makes a great product that, you know, can kind of be a remote talent, if you will, that you bring in to your productions. But it all, the days of IMAG and just, you know, being at a, a, an event and having a person, a talking head on a screen are long gone and weeks of work need to be put into deciding what your content is because there has to be so much put in at the beginning of this is, you know, we're going to put this on the screen instead of just a camera shot. And then we're going to go to this live video or this pre-recorded video. And, and, and I, unfortunately, all the tools to bring it together aren't all there together cohesive yet, but I think it's, it's getting better. And there's, there's, there's ways to, to pull it off. You just have to, you have to prep a lot more in advance and everyone has to know what the expectation is. Um, and I, I think the, having the little smaller virtual meetings, spread out and then having your big your big town hall meeting at some point right that's how you do that and you kind of everybody builds that uh show template if you will of, of how what they're going to and what they're working towards then you have the big event and it all comes across a lot easier because you've got all that prep work going into it right and what's your take on it matt morgan from ross yeah ross has been um you know taking it's it's needing to take all of these um solutions that from a company that ross has had for years now and then tweaking them to make them a little bit easier and more effective in these kind of conversations that we're having right something that's might have been more uh traditionally used in a newsroom how can that apply to a corporate event space or for you know um something like what what kyle does i've Kyle and I have we have some we have some history working together some of these events and um, actually that one of the first real big ones when uh, when the world came to a halt you know and we had to figure out this exact thing uh, kind of live in real time and it was it was how do we take the tools we have today and um, maximize their impact um, and then look you know with all of those all those learnings and say what tools are already out there that we can kind of reconfigure. And we can use for uh, scheduling and for asset management and for workflow purposes. And um, so, what it's I, I love that there's been such a um, an an opportunity to see how things can be maximized and how products can be maximized and workflows and things like that that weren't typically accessible to us before and rethinking them. Um, and I know from Ross's perspective, it's been. It's been really cool to see me going from the customer side when all of this kind of happened to now being a part of it and how those those wheels are turning from product teams and development from not just Ross, but um, what we learned from the summit back in January that we're all kind of in that position. And from a manufacturing side, what 
what position can we hold with uh, our end users and our and our customers to be able to give them that flexibility they really need? So um, for me, I, I love seeing that the turn of using products that once had a very focused uh, use and now on a broader scale for people to use every single day, um, whether it's just a live event or just a broadcast event or something that um, is happening in tandem, which um, again, uh, a lot of us here have been having to do the the hybrid live and in-person events. I have a question uh, while well, you have the floor, Matt. So what specific tools and processes and effects that Ross has built over the last two and a half years? Because one of the things Microsoft saw over the last year and a half or so was templatizing helps save budget. Mm -hmm. So, so um, you know, you're not having to reinvent the wheel for every event. You're kind of taking what you did for the last event, building off of it, but keeping some of the things that worked. So from a Ross perspective, um, and Mo's not here from Ebert, so you get the floor. Um, what what are you guys taking from that and providing as an off-the-shelf kind of offering? Just yeah. to throw out a couple of examples. Yeah, the 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 one that when we're talking workflow, things like that, um, really it's taking uh, the inception newsroom system and making it inception live to be able to talk with social media platforms be able to communicate with um, asset management being able to work a show flow that's just very easy to work in and out of um, again that's something that even I'm, I'm talking as recent as a couple of days ago having rebranding of this because for for me to talk to a corporate customer potentially um, or someone who hasn't been working in the, the newsroom, you know, they don't want to see newsroom flow workflow. They want they want to know that it works for them. So rebranding it as Inception Live, so that we show them a, a proper workflow of what you need, when you need it, the right talent, the right assets, and having one central location where those things can all come together. So um, Inception working with Prime Stream is really big for us and for a lot of customers who are are working with a lot of different. Um, People across remote, you know, remote uh, work sites, hybrid work sites um, from different multiple states, multiple countries, being able to work all those things together to have almost a completely cloud-based uh, production. Um, so th those are really big products that I would say are are right now kind of at the forefront uh, for that workflow. You know, that's that's in addition to you know obviously the the gear that that we sell and whatnot. I would say those are the platforms that I would love to see get out there a little bit more. And I'm excited to work with people more as we uh, kind of go down this corporate uh, rabbit hole, if you will, of what that looks like. And um, so I, I can I can just say with a lot of certainty that the, the product teams at Ross um, have this in mind of how would they can shift what they're known for and what we can, how we can make it easier and more accessible for, for prospects potentially to use those um, broadcast historic systems more in their context. Cool. Thank you. I'm going to throw out a question. Um, Mr. Michaels was pretty active on a couple of comments, so there's some great things there. But uh, Kristen is asking, what's next with regards to virtual events? Better tech, audio, video, um, quality, improved interaction, global production, Unreal MetaHuman, lots of stuff to unpack there. Does anybody have any thoughts about what's coming around the corner? What can you speak to? If you can't speak to it, talk as vague as you want. <laughs> I, I can talk to a little of it. Um, we, you know, we do something every day where we have people coming in from all over the world. In fact, Kirsten is one of them. <laughs> so, so the, uh, but we have people literally uh, every day we get up and we've cobbled together a system that has the, the question management system completely tied into managing the super sources that are coming out of the switcher, uh, the graphics, the lower thirds. And so for us, we're integrating a lot of tools that haven't belonged together in the past. We're using program called Isadora to, to it's which is kind of a low code logic system to run all of the systems we use another program called universe which is used for events uh, to build a, a web interface that people can just go in there and build that but all the super sources lower thirds all that's being done dynamically uh, through tying those together and working with these developers um, both with our development with our Q&A system as well as uh, the developers at Isadora and Universe and Zoom, um, so that all of those things tie together. I mean, I think that one of the biggest things that changed what we do in production is Zoom ISO. Uh, we're able to take 16 channels of 1080p 30 out of a 
out of a Mac studio <laughs> you know, wow. and pass it wow. in all, all of it into our system. And so we've been able to really tie a lot of this stuff together and at a level that we couldn't do before we're taking Dante out and channels. So a lot of this stuff is, um, being able to be interacted with, and we're able to build that. And by building it, part of it's in hardware. So we've got a stack of of hardware that's kind of managing a lot of this all the way down to color correcting every single person that's in there. Um, but also, uh, building a custom stack that allows us to do that, but it's repeatable, you know, we're using it every single day and the folks that are using it are not traditional broadcast. Um, they're trained, you know, from scratch <laughs> you know, to, to use this system. And again, it's been, uh, it's been one of those things that I think that we're just seeing the very beginning, this, this technology that we're kind of cobbling together, um, is just as, what we're probably going to see at NAB is a huge jump forward in a lot of these tech and a lot of this tech. And throughout this year, we're going to see a massive exponential change in the tools that are available to us to do these events. And that's going to change how we do them. We're getting a bunch of questions about the tools in the, in the chat. So let me bring you Ryan into it. You see, you're getting your hands on a lot of different gears, anything uh, that you you'd like to highlight, anything that you can point your finger at. So this is making a difference. Well, that's a tough one for me. <laughs> we just, uh, I mean, we span so many different manufacturers. And I think for us, the harder side of that is uh, a lot of our decisions are client based and what they're, you know, whether a Zoom house, a Teams house, a Google Meet house, you know, all those, all those varieties come into it. Um, so, um, you know, we still want to extract all of that and put it into a switcher, honestly. Um, we're, we're, we're just, we haven't got past that. Um, and it's, it, it, it uh, makes a, a Swiss army knife answer to that difficult. Right. So I, I don't, I don't have a good one that I'm going to hitch my horse to. Anybody else want to uh, throw in some ideas and uh, drop some names and help people out? Anybody from the audience? Let's talk. There was a question about the engagement, right? And we're not getting a huge engagement. Let's face it, guys. Let's get engaged, right? Uh, but uh, what about an engagement tools? Anything specifically that uh, Microsoft's using, Alex Georgesco? To get I people mean, out? we're we're using Teams, right? So um, there's tons of interactivity in there, um, and it's it's there for chat. So we're using it as a planning tool, and we're using it during our events for people to connect with each other. Um, there's a ton of functionality that's going into it to make it easier for, for people to, to work together and for it to integrate with more, more things on the back end. Um, so it's like a, a meeting tool and a product and a planning tool um, and a connection tool. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm used to just being in teams all day. So it's, it's, that's probably the thing that I'm using most. And then it's so familiar to me at events too, but it's not necessarily what everybody else is familiar with. Um, but but I think we're focusing on connection and interactivity as well, right? Like we want the digital participant to feel like they are engaged and involved. Um, and, and that's where we're experimenting with each one of these bigger events. Like how do we get the, the digital attendee uh, an amazing experience. So how are you going to add an AI engine to this chat, right? So that they'll be picking, it'll be sucking in all your words and asking the questions for us. So that's the, you know, well, is that too outrageous to even think about? I mean, I'm just waiting for it to summarize all my meetings because there's so much going on. Like I want to take my notes with me without having to write them down and then miss the next thing. So like, don't, don't get me started on AI because that could be a whole topic on its own. <laughs> I, I, I do think that AI is going to change a lot of things within what we do as events. I mean, everything from uh, looking at the questions, one of the big problems we get into when we have high velocity systems. So we have, you know, 200 comments a minute, you know, that kind of thing on those kinds of sizes or, or a thousand comments a minute. Um, we have to go through all those comments and figure out which ones are similar, which ones belong together, and which one is the best one of the bunch. So if we get 50 questions that are the same, um, then we have to figure out which those are. And we see AI and, and the stuff we're seeing with ChatGPT4 to be key to doing that, to smartly go out, grab the, grab the stuff, bring it back to a human, and have the human maybe make the final decision, but make, make, make intelligent decisions as they come through. Um, I think that along with the languaging is going to be massive. And Mac Microsoft has been in the lead for this for a long time, but I think that that the, um, you know, we're going to get to a point where we're not thinking about language that 
much. You know, if you're list watching a show and you're in Tanzania, you're going to hear it in Swahili and potentially five years from now, their mouth may look like it's speaking Swahili <laughs> and you're hearing, you know, them talking in Swahili in their voice. Um, while, you know, it's very Star Trekky, but it's, we're that close now. The, the technologies are already there and already being tested. And so we're going to see this go into events where, you know, language and is, is you know, kind of falls away. Well, and same with like eyesight, right? Like a lot of uh, being able to read your notes and having you still look like you're looking straight at the audience and and uh, eye contact. So like we are really close to that stuff, just actually being a reality. And I'm very excited for it. Bring Kyle into this conversation. Kyle, any thoughts on this? From have you played yeah. around? With regarding the engagement pieces, for us, that's a huge, a huge thing for us. Uh, having just a handful of in-person events a year, um, the networking side of those in-person events has been critical for people. Um, to network with other people that they don't know, but also to discuss content, to discuss the speaker's content and how that applies to their team. And so in our transition to these virtual events, we have lost some of that. And so we're working and we have been working with a partner as our online platform who have been developing and building tools for us that have really helped us make that jump in. We, we haven't wanted to do Zoom breakout discussions for these events because we don't want to lose people to a separate system and platform. <clears throat> so we now have this uh, opportunity to bring people into a virtual room within our online experience platform so that they can have that discussion, that it can be facilitated if we want it to, or it can be an open forum. And then we can close that when it's time to pull everybody back into our content. And that has worked really well for us last year. <clears throat> and we're now adding more of that space into our, our show to facilitate some more of those those times for people to engage with each other. One of the things, um, I just look at my notes from our January session and, and Mikey from Google had brought up an interesting thing that didn't get touched on very much, but it's an interesting one because from a corporate and perspective, it's, you know, the, uh, it, uh, I don't know who's talking there. Um, uh, security is really important depending on the content. It could be um, a very important meeting between senior leadership and management and no other employees are access to it, but they want to have the same level of production for that kind of very tight group. So tools like Teams obviously is a secure environment and it's tenant based and, and some of these outside tools, while they may have lots of cool bells and whistles, sometimes the corporations and their media teams are locked into the tools that provide those secure tunnels to their employees. So just something to factor in for those well, larger companies. And the biggest problem we have is that actually that, that we have people who don't want to deal with the, the security of it. So we have, you yeah. know, Zoom, Zoom went from being not secure to extremely secure in the summer of 2020, but we couldn't persuade people to turn all the dials on. So we, we, we'd be talking to like ministers of defense and all these things like, we really think we should turn all these up. And they're like, oh, that's too hard to log into. <laughs> so, so that, you know, so, so they, so they didn't want to deal with it. So that, that mm -hmm. mixture of uh, convenience uh, and security is always the thing that's that's a little tricky. There is a question in the chat. Who, I don't know if any, who wants to grab it about multi-platform uh, events where Teams and Zoom work together instead of hosting a Zoom call. Is anybody doing this? Is, is there? Yeah, uh, been, how does it work? It. Well, we so the, we use we usually do that with hardware. So to get back to what Ryan was talking about earlier. So uh, we started doing those in about 2012, so qu for quite some time. And basically, we had an interconnect that is that got a lot of bandwidth. We were we were in a place called 2000M, which is in DC, and it's got all the connections <laughs> that you could possibly have. And so inside of that interconnect, we could move between satellite, the switch, AVOC, uh, LTN, as well as Skype um, at the time, Hangouts, you know, and uh, uh, Cisco, and a variety of other ones. So basically, we have. Uh, I/O in a server that are all those different things, and it's just, then then we're using hardware to mix and match any of those together, um, and it's just a, a lot of mixed minuses, <laughs> you know, so both in video and audio that that you have to kind of figure out. But and there's you know latency going in and out, and obviously quality differences between the platforms. But but we found that you know with a lot, especially with uh, you know frame fr frame legalizers, we could get everything to to talk to each other fairly effectively. One of the first the biggest challenges we had, and I don't mean to really harp on the past, but it's still uh, re relevant today, is uh, personalized IFB back to each individual caller. And I don't care what platform you're using, 
everybody wants their own mix minus and everybody wants their own IFB. And so it all needs to run, to answer your question, Marty, it all needs to run through a, a professional broadcast environment. If you have a lot of mixed bag of things coming in, if you want it to be that level of a show, meaning customized, everything goes through an audio switcher, an audio mixer, everything goes through a video switcher. So kind of old school on that one. I share Ryan's um, kind of take on that. Yeah, and uh, TVU Party Line was one of the ones that I, we stepped into a good bit that that handled that really well because every every talent that came in that mix minus was done essentially in there. You're not burning, you know, all the aux sends on your mixer to to create all that. So there are tools that make that easier, but you're still limited to the number of users you're going to pull through that, right? And that's if you're just using TVU, but then, right. You know, in our, our system, we 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 have leaned on both uh, Clear Clearcom's FreeSpeak as well as Unity, and Unity is probably the easiest one for us to 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 provide those backend systems to, to allow clients to just simply log on to those things. Now, what we're using on our end is a BSS eight hundred six, which is allowing us to build um, very very complex audio pipelines. So all the mix minuses are all built in for all the participants, and so then that allows us to have someone on the edge. So we can have a producer watching the show anywhere in the world and simply push down on a button and talk straight into the ear of the host or the reader or whoever they, they need to talk to. And we, again, in our show that we do every morning, uh, every person on that panel is on on Unity and it's mixed in with their, we do it as a, as a sidebar. So it's mixed in with their, their in-ear uh, returns. And we worked a lot on that on that process to make that work. But we can talk to anybody. We can talk to the host. We can do all the error correction. And as as Peter said, it is and comms are fifty percent of every show. But it, it is even more important when you're doing virtual events to be able to talk to people. We've done all kinds of stuff live in front of thousands of people where we're having one person log out. We're telling the host to just no, don't go to that person for a minute. We got to restart their <laughs> their machine. And and all those things can happen while we're still moving and while the train's still going. And and Kyle, any thoughts? Um, I would only be repeating what Alex and some others have said. I think that was all good. Good, good. I got a question for for Alex. You you touched on the, the Q and A side. Uh, is you have a what tool are you using to bring chats, Q and A, those kind of things into a program feed or you know live? That's also got some kind of filter in it, so people can't just post any random thing that they want that goes live, right? What what tools have have been used for that? I built man. <laughs> so so I, about 15 I years ago, about 15 years ago, we built it where we, we do make it available. So we have clients that, you know, that, that use it, we've used it in a variety of events. And so it, it'll handle up to about 150,000 users at a time. Um, it doesn't, it, it starts to crank creak a little bit at about 150,000. Um, but, but outside of that, it, it works pretty well. Everything below that. Um, basically what it does is it's a, there's a front end to it. There's two versions of it. One that scrapes, uh, social networks. So it'll just go in and grab stuff out of Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and, and Twitch and another one that is the front end. And so we stream into that front end. There's a second interface that, that allows you to just look at it on your phone. So it doesn't have the video. It just lets you watch your Apple TV or whatever and, and be able to comment. And so what we basically, we give the user a chat interface as well as a question system. If you put, if you only have chat, people ask questions in the chat. And if you only have questions, they chat in the questions. <laughs> so you have to have both of those, those patterns. Once it goes into there, it goes back into a backend management system that can be routed to all the panelists. Uh, the panelists can then raise their hands uh, to say what they want to, you know, wh what questions they want to answer. Uh, and then the, the host, though, still has control of what that looks like. When that's activated, that's tied back into the into the graphics system. So we're using SPX, which is a, an open and uh, open format. Um, so we use SPX and Casper. Uh, and so our question system sends that data to SPX to run in as a lower third, um, as well as all the panelists, lower thirds and everything else. Um, that's also being tied in. That's also being queued into Isadora, which is then being driven by un uh, uh, Universe, which is then talking to Mix Effect, which then talks to an ATEM, <laughs> so the Black Magic constellation that does all the work and pulls all those things together to make it all work. And so, and again, it's something that we use in office hours. We use it every day, um, and it's, so it's uh, it's constantly being updated. And we customize it for other folks where we take a bunch of features out or put other features in. It also has teleprompter and um, uh, lower thirds tools and a lot of other things that, you know, so we can drive those teleprompt, drive it to a teleprompter remotely or, or on, on site. What's everybody That's doing a lot of with registration? Sorry, sorry, Ryan. What's everybody doing with registration data? What you can speak to? 
registration. <laughs> it's hard. Just out of curiosity. Of course, it's all in a private bubble, but uh, when people register, are you taking that data, customizing your content to the event, or is the event the event and the registration data is for the next event? Well, I would, for us, I would like to get to a point where we're able to scour that registration data and see which people are coming from which marketplace to see, are we looking at a lot of business leaders? Are we looking at a lot of NGO leaders, nonprofit leaders? Um, Are we looking at a lot of church leaders? And then being able to tailor our content for them and for those people. Um, Additionally, seeing how are are a lot of these viewers of ours new, new people, or are those some of our kind of core team that have stuck with us over the last 25 years and they're coming back for more because they like what they get or, and that'll help us tailor our hosting announcements and our, our, our content to either promote heavily into our future events or to lean into what we have done and serving those people that keep coming back for more. And, and we use the, the, we do a lot of publicly facing events. And so the number one thing that we're dealing with is troll suppression. So, so we're, uh, we tie everybody to their phone so that they, you know, so that we, if we kick them out, they can't, they have to get a new phone before they can come back in. Um, so, uh, so that's the, so we're mostly interested in, we do events, most of our events on a daily basis are a handful of people, a couple hundred people at a time. But on the bigger events that we have, we may have, you know, 10,000 people in there and some of them it's a publicly event and you get all kinds of things you don't want to see. And so being able to pop them out is a, is a useful thing for us. Um, I think that as we look at a lot of the trends that we see right now is between California and the, and the EU and GDPR and everything else, the, um, the appetite to give us data is probably going to drop dramatically. Um, and so people are, are signing out of ATT, they're signing out of all those other things. They're not going to want to give us data for much longer. So, um, I think that the data driven registration is probably going to go away because uh, most users are becoming more and more sensitive to it, mostly because Apple's marketing against it. Well, I think, you know, Alex Georgescu, you, you made an interesting comment in the chat about the fact that just how do you, there's so many tools, how do you pick the right ones, right? It's confusing. And we're all about to get much more confused in, when Las Vegas happens in a few weeks or what is it, 40 days or something like that. Um, uh, everybody's going to be going to Vegas. Everybody's going to go to NAB. Companies like uh, like Ross will be uh, huge booths or 10,000 square foot, foot. So the big shows are back, I guess. We'll see. Um, but uh, uh, let me, let me any, uh, I'm not sure if all of you go to NAB, but some of you are. And if you're not going to NAB, is there, are there any particular things you're looking for right now any things that you see that are the glue that you're looking to make the difference in your productions, uh, the the that magic magic box that uh, you've been hearing about. Let's talk a little bit about the cloud. It's, it's the buzzword, right? Uh, how how's that going to affect what you're doing? So, uh, Brian, are you going to NAB? Uh, do you have any uh, any things you're you're keeping an eye out for? Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. Um, you know, when it comes to the topic at hand that we're we're dealing with here, I, I I'm looking at. At what's new in the NDI world? What's what's going on with IPX? Like, I, you know, for this for this scale of production, that type of format, as opposed, you know, we do we do a lot of broadcast twenty one ten work as well. But I feel like that's a higher level, and then what we need for this type of event. So I I, I kind of want to see what's. I like going all the stuff on the outside edges, right? I, of course, I'm going to go to Ross. So I'm going to go to the big ones, but I want to see the other smaller groups, and I want to see what they're up to and what you know, new, new tools they're, they're coming out with that are sneaking through and nobody knows about. Peter T you're going to be there. What are you looking for? Yeah. You know, I'm kind of echoing Ryan. Um, It's going to be what's next. I know that cloud is going to be ubiquitous. Maybe it's calmed down a little bit. Um, I think we're coming down from the cloud just a hair. I think on prem cloud is becoming a little more common. Um, So um, is it going to be a hybrid of both? I don't know. I'm looking for the NDIs, the, um, the next generation of uh, democratizing 2110 and video over IP production switching. Um, so it's not just about the big boys running full 2110 up compressed in their facilities, running eight cores. It's, it's what else is in there that is going to be earth shattering. Ross, Blackmagic, everybody's going to have some interesting things I'm sure they're going to be showing off. So. Kyle, any thoughts on that? 
Yeah, for me, it's going to be cloud production. <clears throat> we're really leaning heavily into that as we're outgrowing our the physical space that we have been using <clears throat> and the infrastructure there. And as we look at segmenting some of our content out to different markets uh, and hitting those with some customizable content, that's going to be a, a big thing for us. And Alex G., I, I don't know if you're going, but if there, is there anything you're looking for in general? I, I'm not going. I'm really sad, but I'll be at a different conference event. I think um, AI is going to be the big trend um, of, of what will – Microsoft will be there. So go go see the Microsoft booth. Go say hi to uh, all my peeps that are there. I love them, and I'm jealous that I won't be there. Uh, but um, I – you know, what I really love about uh, conferences like NAB is that you're – you go there and then you get an idea for, you get inspired because somebody's doing something in a new way. And like, it, it just sparks new conversation and a, potentially a new way, a new thought or idea of doing something in a way you hadn't thought of before. So um, that's what, that's what I mainly get from in-person events like that, especially ones that are showing like new tech and um, things that you might've not been familiar with. Gotcha. And Alex Lindsay, I, I hear you're going to be there too, right? Is, are, you yeah. bringing, are you bringing office hours to NAB? What's going I, on? We are. Office hours, we'll probably have somewhere between 40 and 50 people covering off, covering the event. Um, we've got about uh, 30 to 35 on offsite and about 10 to 15 onsite. Um, we're going to have a couple live views there bouncing around um, doing the broadcast. So we're going to do some stuff with our panel that we do on a daily basis. And then we'll do some stuff that's straight to, uh, to YouTube. Uh, we'll be experimenting with uh, uh, both 5.1 and HDR streaming <laughs> while we're doing that. So one of the things I'll be looking at a lot is um, looking at the new Atmos tools, looking at the new uh, HDR. It's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, uh, but also a lot of glue. Um, I think that the, uh, the, you know, the Sony FR7 from our perspective, from a, from a remote participant perspective has been groundbreaking. Uh, while I don't have one now, I had one for three weeks and now I had to <laughs> I have to really, really think that whole system. Um, and so I think that we're going to see more cameras from Sony. I do think that 2110 will be a big deal this, this year. And um, and so uh, so I think that uh, 2110 is kind of growing up. Um, and so I think it'll be interesting to see how that goes. Uh, and then the one thing I would say is no matter what you do, make sure to go check out. I don't know what they're going to do, but Sony in the past has had an LED wall that shows you the future of video. Um, and if they, if, they sh if they actually show it, it's 8K HDR 10 uh, 120 frames per second and you need to see it like if you're going to nab the one thing you need to see is what 120 frames per second looks like uh, because everyone is close to being able to release that and it's it's a really really it's the best so best delivery i've seen in the public um of, of 120 frames per second 8k great and of course there's the bnh party i don't know if tom baldessari is still on but you know get in touch with him and get invited uh it's monday BNH night party it's, it's at the marquee so let's not forget about the parties all right they still i am here you are there but hey baldessari put, put, put your uh, put your email address in there so people can get invited to the party man i'm increasing your bar yes. bill right now how do we get the bracelet I just um we're trying to do uh something beforehand as well we're trying to plan something at the Cosmopolitan, so I'll keep everybody in loop for that as well. Good. Well, so, all right. And but the party's definitely on. Uh, I'll put my email address in there now, and we'll take it from there. You got it. Thanks, Tom. All right. Well, Thank listen, you guys. Thank you, guys. This has been great. You can keep the conversation. The the, uh, uh, the engagement was going on. They were having some great conversations in the chat. You know what? So uh, thanks again. We kept it. We're trying to keep it tight to forty five minutes, and we're a little over. Uh, it's time for our uh, for the for, for the thank you guys. It's, we're going to try to regroup again after NAB with these uh, weekly conversations. We'll pick a topic and get some people together. So these seem to be working well. So uh, you won't hear from us until after NAB, but you'll start seeing pings for some weekly Q and A's like this going on. And uh, and I thank all of you for being part of the original show. Original. I look forward to you guys being part of next year's show. And uh, you know we'll just stay in touch. Uh, so thank you again, everybody. We're going to, you know, let me share my screen one uh, last time. Thanks to this team of, of leaders. And, uh, and, and again, stay in touch. You're on our list. You'll hear from us and hopefully see us at the, at the B&H party at the show. Um, with that, our extra other partner, Amy Lounsbury, uh, come on in and, uh, and let's, let's kick off the job fair and explain to people how to go into the breakouts and meet with Andrew and Savannah. Great. All right, everybody. So stay for the job fair, please. Uh, the way that you access the job fair is go down at the bottom of your screen. You're going to see breakout rooms. Click on that. 
Hop into the virtual job fair, meet Savannah and Andrew. We'll tell you about ASG and we'll hear a little bit about you, get to know you. And we've got lots of opportunities and lots of openings. So check us out. Thanks, Amy. And thanks everyone for being part of our Q&As. Uh, we'll stay in touch. And if you're going to be at the show, have a great NAB. Thanks, everyone.